Um, so, hi, Malcolm Norman. I'm the Global CISO at Wood. 60,000 people, 60 locations, um, uh, 50 countries. Um, what I'm going to talk about for maybe four or five minutes, because um, I think the questions at the end are far more important than me blathering away, is how do you put the chief into chief information security officer? Uh, I want to do a couple uh, of things first. Who, put your hand up if you're under 25. Thank you. Put your hand up uh, if you are over 35. Okay. Put your hand up if you're in education of some sort now. Put your hand up, please, if you're in some sort of corporate uh, security or technology role. Do you know what? Absolutely fascinating. It's a 50-50 split here, and it's... Uh, it's, uh, I said you're a tough gig, and I think that's going to be uh, the toughest part of the whole thing, because am I talking to guys who are starting their career, or actually individuals who now want to know the, uh, uh, the silver bullet? Um, let's see where we go with this. Um, I don't believe you can train anybody to be a Chief Information Security Officer. I don't think that if you can become a Chief Information Security Officer by being, by doing a degree in technology, doing CISSP, or any of the rest. I think you can learn skills and techniques and, uh, and procedures, but actually there's far more to it than that. And Mike and I have spoken previously about he, how he hires uh, uh, his team. Um, and it's not through looking at CV and saying, I've got a degree in <coughs> cybersecurity. It's actually by testing people's ability. So, how on earth do you put the C into uh, Chief Information Security Officer? So, I'm 54 years old, so I'm glad I didn't ask uh, for anybody who is uh, uh, over 50, because I'm certainly I'm probably only the only person here. I trained as a teacher. Uh, I, I, I spent four years at university training to be a teacher. And what I realized was that can't train to be a teacher, you need experience, you need knowledge, you need to have an empathy. Of all the things that I have done in my career, that has been the best preparation for being a Chief Information Security Officer. Because you know, we'll look across uh, uh, the, the majority of people uh, here and you know, you're deep technologists. Actually, it's ensuring that you are educating, training, and developing the awareness of your global company that is far, has far greater impact than any single piece of technology. Training, education, and awareness. Being able to have 60,000 conversations across my organization will have far greater value than me putting in another firewall. Because these guys will find a way around it. The training education that the likes of Tech Force provide far more impactful, and I hope we can come back to that uh, in training. Uh, in question, sorry. I spent 20 years in the military, 20 years in counterintelligence and counter uh, counterinsurgency in Northern Ireland, uh, Bosnia, Macedonia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. What did I learn? I had to protect my force, and this is Corona Company, 1st Battalion of the Duke of Wellington's Regiment, uh, in just outside Basra after the war, where I was given the task of securing the, an area the size of Wales with uh, just over 100 soldiers, 50 dilapidated uh, snatch Land Rovers, which were poorly designed for that environment. And I had to protect those guys, but also uh, the Ramela Oil District. What did I learn? We've got to be successful all of the time. We've also got to allocate very scarce resources amongst competing ends. How do I ensure that I protect the gas oil separation plants in an area the size of Wales with those guys? I just can come back and compare that to how do you provide protection to a perimeter that is 600 locations, 60,000 people, hundreds of, uh, uh, of thousands of clients gaining access to your data. 
the allocation of scarce resources amongst competing ends are a really important lesson. The other thing that I learned was that you can't lead by a follow me approach. You cannot say, I'm going to do everything everywhere. The perimeter is too big. And so how do you lead in that very dispersed um, uh, environment? Think about that when you're looking uh, at how you protect a, uh, an environment like ours. You've got to be good all of the time. The bad actors have only got to be lucky once. So what's really interesting is that we're talking to Mike being one of the best um, black hat hackers in the world. When people say, what keeps you up at night? It's people like Mike. What I am certain of though, is that the proportion of the Mikes attacking my organization, <coughs> as opposed to the average hacker who is lazy, will go for the easiest, uh, uh, easiest route in, and will try and exploit quickly and get out, rather than, uh, uh, than uh, spending a deal of time to gain real knowledge, is far greater. And so whilst I've got to be great and good at the mics, I actually can provide some fairly standard uh, hygiene protecting against the average hacker. And I think we can perhaps have a discussion about that. The other thing is that I'm a parent. I've probably learned more from these two guys than I have from any, and I apologize, teacher or lecturer, because it's about boundaries here. And initially, we start with boundaries quite close, and then we push against them. They push against them, but there are boundaries. How can I help them develop within those boundaries? Perhaps it comes back to the teaching piece again. And then corporate security. So in 2007, um, I uh, was sitting outside the chief of the general staff's office, the head of the British Army, as his uh, military attaché. Um, and I saw one star and two star generals walking in uh, for their final day in, uh, uh, in the service. I would say, so General, what are you going to do? He said, I have no idea, Malcolm. I've got no idea what I'm going to do next. And I realized in my late 30s that if I was not going to be a general, I probably wouldn't have been, I need to find a second career. <coughs> and so I looked at everything from teaching through to um, a hedge fund uh, manager. A hedge fund manager, really hilarious discussion with the, uh, the head of the Barclays Bank, uh, who said, so Malcolm, have you read the uh, third article on the fourth page of the uh, Financial Times today? I haven't, so very clearly I didn't get that job. So what I realized was that I needed to hit the ground running. And so I looked at corporate security, and in 2007, physical security was the most prevalent uh, threat that corporate organizations feared. We just had, relatively recently, um, the 7-7 bombings in, uh, uh, in London. And prior to that, uh, in the States, obviously, uh, the uh, September 11th, and the protection of people and property was undoubtedly the most um, important thing on the minds of chief executives business continuity, how are we going to respond to an incident when uh, the, uh, the, the, we're involved in some form of terrorist attack? The media did a fabulous job uh, of blinkering um, executives. Mm, quite interesting, isn't it? What do you think the blinker, blinkers are now for chief executives from a security perspective? Perhaps we can explore that uh, in conversation later. Where were the uh, information security team? And I do apologize to uh, some of the, the old, older brethren in the, uh, uh, in, in the audience, but physically and perhaps even metaphorically, information security was in the basement. It wasn't seen as a important threat to uh, organizations. It was just about perimeters. Build a bigger perimeter, protect it, and if people get in, we'll just do business continuity. Over the last 12 years, my career has shifted from physical security and business continuity and having uh, an information security team 
uh, based in the basement to actually now being a global chief information security officer. And as a result, you look at uh, corporate organizations and there's been a significant shift in corporate security. Obviously, we're concerned about our, uh, our people and our property, but it was sat here in, uh, in Aberdeen. Uh, the, uh, the new oil, the new goal is data. That gives my CEO the greatest concern. How do they, how do, how does he prove to his clients that we have a robust and resilient approach to, uh, to, to the security of their data and of our data? So what uh, um, you actually see on the bottom right is, uh, is, is my team. It's actually quite small, isn't it? And that's my whole global team. Actually, what we've done, having smashed two large organizations, Wood Group and Amit Foster Wheeler together, uh, is outsource our security. So behind them are uh, almost 120 individuals sat around the globe um, managing our security operations center and our managed security service. This, uh, I put this slide up for two reasons. First, um, it's uh, the team uh, at the uh, Brewdog uh, Brewery, proving that I can organize a piss up in a brewery. Um, but secondly, um, and you can't actually see it here, um, but uh, the, um, this is a Brewdog customer pledge. Um, and I'm going to get close because, uh, in fact, I can't even read it on there, but there are, there, are, there are four things. Essentially, you've got a voice, use it. Secondly, um, don't be a dick. Thirdly, Andrew, can you think of any of the others? Oh, goodness. Get shit done, Malcolm. Get shit done, Malcolm, which is actually what Andrew says to me most days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the other side is that being a global chief information security officer is not about me going and doing the threat hunting. It's about me leading. It's about me leading upwards to the chief executive, the executive leadership and the board. It's about me leading across the, uh, uh, the technology organization. And interestingly, often the biggest friction is not from the hacker, it's from our infrastructure team uh, who are trying to balance anything, anywhere, anytime, convenience to, shouldn't we keep it secure? So perhaps we can explore that in, in questions later. Um, okay. So that, I hope, has given you a few teasers um, around some questions later. Um, a couple of months ago, I went uh, for dinner with four of the chief information security officers, and I was doing a, a preparation for, a, for another talk. I thought it was really quite interesting when, uh, um, when I said, so guys, if they were going to make a film about our day job, you know, what would it be? Would it be a... Would it be a comedy? Would it be a tragedy? Would it be a horror film? Would it be uh, some sort of, um, one of them said, was it uh, you know, a rom-com? God knows where, where his mind was going with that. Um, but what we then said, and we, we never, we didn't decide what it was. I think, I think we ended with some sort of uh, comedy, horror, rom-com. But we then said, so if we were going to look at who was going to be playing the part, what characters would we look at? And the first was the users. And the, one of the things that really, really, really upsets me is that you hear so many people saying, our users are our weakest link. They're our dunces. The problem that we have is that these guys will exploit them. They'll ex they will socially engineer them. They will exploit the vulnerabilities that they create because of convenience of one side and lack of security of the other. But who's at fault if these guys are our weakest link? Me. I have not gone back to my teaching and given them training, education, and awareness. So if you hear somebody say, our people are our weakest link, the question you should ask the person speaking to them, you know, saying that is, so what are you doing about it? The executives, yeah, head in the sand, or are they? I think, again, it's a very lazy piece to say that uh, executives are not interested. They are. 
but there's a significant amount of other risks that our CEO, uh, our executive leaders now face. So we've just slammed two large organizations together and made promises to the City of London that we're going to deliver on some financial, uh, um, financial gains. So if I go to him and say, your greatest threat is that played by cyber attack, he would say, Malcolm, I, I thank you for your opinion, but I think it's the fact that we're not making enough money and we're costing too much. So my job is to actually educate, train, and provide awareness of the appropriateness of where security, uh, if something happens, we'll deal with it. The police were exactly the same. It was not a priority. Over the last five years, I've seen a significant investment in law enforcement across the globe, but particularly from a UK perspective. And I now trust the National Cyber Security Centre, the, the NCA, uh, and the various police forces to support me. Gone have the days where I would be concerned about um, connecting with law enforcement because I thought they would the, then go to the Information Commissioner. We will definitely explore that in, uh, in, in, in questions later. <laughs> the regulators, uh, does anybody know who this is? Yep. Oh, no, I'm fair, Andrew. Get shit, get shit done, Malcolm. Um, it's the child catcher from, uh, uh, from Chichi Chitty Bang Bang. The regulators are, um, again, seen by the security industry as we've caught you. Actually, what they're attempting to do through the likes of GDPR, through the likes of NIST-D, is improve the overall average. If the average hacker is getting through our environment because we have not got the basics right, then how are we going to drive that? And so if only the regulators are pushing it, then perhaps uh, we've got it wrong. And of course, there is the CISO. <laughs> Um, and I do think that that's part of the problem. We look at ourselves as the heroes. The uh, you know we're going to come flying in, and we get this you know the adrenaline buzz uh, that Mike was talking about. I get as well when we find some bastard attempting to get inside our environment. I get a huge buzz of catching the fucker. I really do. <laughs> but when I say catch it or her, what we're actually doing is just cleaning them out. We're not catching them. I want to get to a stage where we're using the skills and the experience and the collaboration where we're now catching them. I think it's really interesting, you know, a couple of teasers for questions. Uh, Article 5, it's now a, uh, a part of NATO doctrine that a cyber attack on one, on a nation state is a cyber attack on all, and we will turn our attention. The criminal organizations, the hacktivist groups, those are, um, a, to me, a viable target. Perhaps we could talk about, do you hack back or not? But I also think this is a bit of an issue. I think we've demonized the hacker from a corporate security perspective. I think we have made them um, or almost omnipotent, all-powerful. We've got to change the, the image. And again, how many corporate security videos do you see of the guy wearing the hoodie with some sort of matrix-like um, background? That's not who we're, uh, we're fighting against. We're fighting against well-organized, well-structured um, businesses. And we've got to change the view away from this to a corporate competitor. Because whatever we are attempting to protect, the opposition, the enemy, are attempting to find. And that is what we've got to shift and change. We've got to humanize the hacker or the hacking organizations. All right. Um, no cool stories. Um, uh, but perhaps we can get onto some of those in questions. <laughs>